Home games, away games, games on the moon, it don't matter. We gotta win all of them. Lift off. That's one small step for man, one giant for man. The Eagle has landed. Hello, podcast people. You missed us. Maybe. Hopefully. We missed us. We missed us. Uh, Layup line, we're back. Kyle Radke here with the beloved, uh, the wonderful, the... Um, we need more words to describe Yeah, well, you. I'll, t- I'll take beloved and wonderful. Yeah, yeah, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. Julian Andrews, hey uh, go to Timberwolves.com, read all of his stuff. Late, later on in the episode, we have Tony Campbell, a uh, former rem- member of the Wolves, who's way better than you probably think he was. Really good. Um, yeah, and yeah. also a great guest. So, um, and, and like he's doing cool stuff post basketball. We won't ruin it for you, but like, um, a lot of the guys, their, their lives kind of, I'm, I'm not going to say fall apart, but like it falls off after basketball. And for Tony Campbell, it just seems like he's just keeping on. Yeah. He's just continued to do a lot of really cool things with his life, which yeah. is awesome. Cool dude. Um, the wolves had a, a tough road stretch, um, out East, uh, currently 30 and 34 tied for 10th in the West. Um, but time is ticking obviously. Uh, so what 18 games remaining and, um, you know, per five thirty eight, there's still a chance the wolves have a 2% yeah. chance to make the playoffs. Um, it kind of looks, I remember at one point and obviously a lot can happen in the next 18 games. Um, but like looking at five thirty eight right now, just their projections and they're generally pretty right. Um, all the eight seeds have a at least a ninety five percent chance to get in. All the eight seeds. So like the the eight playoff oh, the, teams okay. in the West. So who do they have? So they it's uh, in the, the Warriors ninety nine percent, Nuggets ninety nine percent, Rockets ninety nine, blah blah blah. Then it's the Clippers ninety six percent, the Spurs ninety five percent, the Kings five percent, and then it's the Wolves two percent, Lakers one percent, huh? Pelicans one percent, um, which is a little odd, I guess, but I mean, you look, I guess if you look at the standings, the Spurs are up four wins on the Kings, um, you know, and down just two losses. Yeah. So we're starting to get a picture. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's just, it's been, this season has flown by. It's been, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy, obviously been a crazy season for a lot of reasons for the Wolves. Um, but I feel like just cause we've had so many big things happen, it's just really made this season really fly by. Yeah. It's a season. Um, not that it's over, but no, I, but you're right. It's like, but it feels like there's been like five mini seasons. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was talking to somebody recently just about, you know, the, just been so wild. Actually I was on, um, Detroit Lakes radio station and we we're kind of talking about it. And, um, they're like, what positives do you take from the season? If obviously if, if you don't make the playoffs and I mean, I think you look at Ryan and, and his development as a coach, I think that's promising. Um, that you acquired Covington and, and, and Daria Saric. Um, and obviously you'd like to see Covington in the lineup. It sounds like we'll see him this weekend. But, um, I mean, I think the biggest thing is the development of Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, there's been questions of whether or not he can be the guy for a team. And um, over the last five games, Carl Anthony Towns has averaged 36.4 points, 16 rebounds, four assists, a block, um, per game while at, while shooting 60.4% from the field, 47.1% from the three point line. Um, that's ridiculous. Those are in, incredible numbers. And and we've talked about this before where the national media and just like their, how they view Carl. I hope it changes because we we've seen some of those TNT broadcasts and, and ESPN broadcasts where they talk about him having empty stats. If you've watched any of these games, it is incredibly clear that these stats aren't empty. I don't know how you can say that they're empty stats when he's scoring with the efficiency he does. Yeah. Just because like he's only taken well, I think it was 22 shots a game or something over the course of that. I mean, stretch and and the most he he took was against the Thunder. He took 27, but he still shot 56% from the field. Yeah, he scored 41 points. You know, yeah. like I don't I don't think that shouldering a huge load for your team is an empty thing to do. Like that's what a superstar is supposed to do. And if you're doing that while well, also dominating every single possession and not distributing the ball and not making your teammates better. That's when I think you start to get into the empty stat discussion, but that's not what's happening with cat right now. So 
Yeah, I don't get the empty stats thing either. I think it's probably because the Timberwolves haven't won as many games as people wanted them to. But if you look at some of the injuries that they've had to fight through and the way that Carl's really kind of put everyone on his back, I I don't know that you can, certainly not in the last couple months, um, but maybe ever, I don't think you can really say that Carl's stats are empty. No, and it's such a silly thing. And I, I think it's just generally like a silly argument to make because like, how do you prove? Like, right, yes, yeah. if you're down by 20, and you score 12 fourth quarter points when they have their backups in. Right. So, yeah, I guess those are empty somewhat. That's not what's happening. But, right. yeah, yeah. Well, it's not like if you, if you look at the last five games for the Wolves, they've all been competitive. I mean, they've been like you know, yeah. the Hawks game and, and the Washington game, they've been like an ugly competitive, but they've been competitive. And then you look up and down the roster and you say, okay, Derek starts the season off hot, right? Kind of cools off and, yep. and, and also injuries, okay? You go Jeff Teague in and out of the lineup. Yep. Uh, Tyus Jones in and out of the lineup, mostly due because he has his injury and then, you know, Teague's injury. So he's going in and out. Um, a Kogi, I think it's safe to say that he hits somewhat of a rookie wall um, as far as his jump shot is concerned. Yep. Still um, an incredible player in a lot of other ways, but Dario still getting offense, used yeah. to the team. Yeah. Um, he had like a five game stretch where he was really good. Um, and then he had a two or three game stretch where he was not very good. So yep. he, he's, you know, back and forth. And then Covington's been hurt. Um, you've gotten some surprise production from guys like Anthony Tolliver, Luol Dang. Um, and then I think like the biggest name is Andrew Wiggins. And I think Wiggs would admit that this year has been a disappointment for him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I I think he'd be the first to admit it. And he has before. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so he's he needs to get better. So to say that like Carl is this like not a winner, I, I just – I. I think it's just such a lazy argument. Yeah. Because it's it, like, how? Yeah. It's an easy thing to say when you don't watch this team. Yeah. You know, and, and national broadcasters don't. And I don't want to get all like local media, national broadcasters. No, but up, I mean, but, it's like, it's, it's, you're right because it's obvious when you're watching the games every single day and you're paying attention. Like, for example, if I would watch Russell Westbrook, who I've been critical of before because yeah. sometimes his shot selection, you know, he was great last night, but it's like, Somebody be like, well, you don't realize all the other stuff he brings to the team. And I would say, yeah, yeah you're, you're right. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. So with Carl, it's like, I mean, I I just don't wonder. It's just a lazy argument for a team. Sure. Has the team been very good over the last 20 years? No. Nope, it hasn't. But to say that, you know, to snowball that you into. You can't put that all on Carl. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing. We talked about like the Anthony Davis stuff in, in an earlier podcast. But it bugs me so much when we think of Anthony Davis as this, you know, how many wonders are there in the world? Six? Uh, I believe seven. Seven. Okay, so we, we act like he's the eighth. Right. Right. Yeah. And then it's like, and I'm not I'm not saying Anthony Davis doesn't deserve deserve it. He's obviously yeah, he's good. One of the top five players, right. best players in the league. But then we we his team has made the playoffs twice in his career there, and he has guys like Drew Holiday who would yeah. be the if you put him on the Wolves, that's probably the second best player. Yeah. So it's like, well, why doesn't Carl get that same benefit of the doubt? Yep. But I mean, I think that there were. Carl took a little while to figure things out. I think early in earlier in his career, and I think earlier in his career, you saw him not calling for the ball as much, not being as assertive. It took him a while to get to where he is defensively. I think you can say now that Carl is a good defender. Yeah, now he's a plus defender. And so I think that some of those things, those things that took longer for him to develop, the media nationally really kind of glommed on to those stories and have kind of just carried them through. But it's time for like a reevaluation in how we think about Towns. Because he's gone from a very good player to a like definite superstar this year, and that's amazing. Yeah, and and the two biggest things of his game um, are one we talked about his defense. His defense has gotten so much better. Um, and like with young players, it's never the fact that they are lazy and they don't want to do it. Some of them, some of them maybe, uh, but it's more so. It's I think it's confusing. It's hard, and players are so good. Yeah. And I don't I don't think Carl knows where to be all the time. Another thing is like let's not forget we're about a month removed from when Carl fouled literally everybody. Right. Like a fly would go by and Carl would foul. Yeah. And you're like, what? Like I, I think you and I talked about there's like a play with like Marcus All and the Grizzlies. Yep. And he like swatted for no reason. Yeah. And it's like don't get that foul with yep. eleven minutes left in the first quarter. And he's been really, really smart with uh you know, w- when he's deciding to a contest a shot exactly um and when he's not contesting and um there's a call in in tuesday night's game against the thunder he got called for a foul that was 
not a foul, but um, but for the most part, like he he's getting smart yeah. on on when to do that and when to not. And then the, the final thing, and this might be the, just a young player thing, and I think with Carl, um, just the way his personality is, I think, um, we, you know, there's all this unicorn talk, right? Right. Where and and like if you're gonna put Perzingis, like I remember like Perzingis was like the the face of the unicorn, like when he yeah. came out, and now it's probably like Giannis, right? But it's like it's so stupid because if like Towns is a better version of per- what Porzingis does, yeah, like a guy that can stretch the yep. floor and he's can post up, yeah. But Towns never gets mentioned in the unicorn conversation. I mean, yeah, the only thing that Porzingis did that Carl doesn't was I mean before he before Porzingis went down was like the blocks, but you saw Carl like he's getting there this yeah. season. So uh, you know, I, I I totally agree. But I think like when you think like unicorn, you think this guy running the seven foot player running down the court and hitting a three or like going up for a layup. And it's like, okay, Carl does that. For, <laughs> yeah. He does it every he night. He Euro-stepped, I don't remember who it was, and then the dunk last night, like he can take the ball from the perimeter to the hoop. It's crazy. This whole idea of like the unicorn is so funny to me. Well, it's, yeah. Like it's totally arbitrary. Oh, yeah. It's just like what? who's a player who does a lot of stuff that we haven't seen, seen before. before. Like, like is Russell Westbrook a unicorn? No, like no, but, but I mean, kind <laughs> is, of. Right? James Harden a unicorn? Nah. Like I don't know. We gotta add more mythical beasts he takes, to this if he lineup. Takes, if the unicate <laughs> unicorn takes four steps before galloping, yeah, and right, we have James right, Harden, right? Exactly. Um, but back to that, Carl. I think he got in his head that he's this like playmaking big. Yeah. And we saw him early in his career and earlier this season. He makes these flashy plays that are flashy slash kind of stupid yeah they're inefficient plays right where i mean and we've seen him make that pass he likes to make that pass to taj gibson um and and now dario uh, where, over the head over the head pass yep. and it's a great pass yeah but we've also seen for every successful pass i've seen like that from him i've seen like three that go out of bounds or that he, you know just yeah it doesn't go where he wants it but to it's go. getting better but it is getting better but he's doing less of it yeah he's just okay if i just pass it normal right and make the right basketball play um, he's he's gotten so good at keeping his eyes on like the the weak side mm-hmm. corner, and I think that's when he's using that over the head that's like really cool. And Okogi gets a lot of those and misses them, so they don't make it a lot onto well, a lot of highlight reels. But it, when he draws that help defender and then go and then goes over the top because he's taller than everyone to that shooter, that is uh that's a that's something that I've noticed him doing a lot this year that I totally love. So that's another point is that. Uh, I made this also, so like we also we, we must sit by each other at work or something and have a lot, a lot of yeah, conversations huh, about funny. basketball. Yeah. Um, that so you have Coving like let's say Covington is Josh and like Josh is way better than anybody could have dreamt of. Yeah. Right. When we We're take him twenty fully team Josh here. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's great, but his jump shot is inconsistent and that's something he needs to work on this off season. But there are plays where you'll have Towns hit him in the corner. And he'll miss the three. And same goes for Wiggs, where Wiggs will drive and kick it to Josh or whoever it is, and they'll miss the three. Where it's if you maybe switch a Kogi in there or right. Covington and right. Kogi, and you're making two more of those a game. Yep. Um, that's a huge difference. It, um, yeah, definitely. And, and, and you know, Kogi will get there some days, like 20 years old. So totally, he'll be fine. Um, and then the last thing, it it, it kind of goes in in part with the not trying to be too flashy. Um, like last night, he got Jeremy Grant switched on him a few times, and instead of doing what I think Carl would have done in the past, like he'll do one of those like Dirk fades, which yep. it's like a super like quote unquote sexy play that everybody loves to see, and somebody will tweet about it. But it's just like an in- inefficient play because yeah. you're not going to get a foul because you're fading away yep. and it's a tough shot. Yep. Instead, Carl just <laughs> lowered his shoulder, <laughs> yeah. dribble, dribble, and then he he'd ba- do the the right hook on yep. the on the left, el- like kind of the elbow. He area. backed him down like 15 feet. That, yeah. that, that was one of my favorite plays of last night. He got switched. I, who did you say it was? It was I, uh, Grant. Yeah, Grant. Like who? I, yeah, and he got switched like just inside the three point line. I thought he just put his back to the basket and pushed him all the way to the yeah, basket. Yeah, it was like great basketball. It was awesome. It was, it yeah. was so much fun. And you were at the arena for it. I, I was not. I yeah. Had a, Man, the crowd was loving Cat last night. I was I was watching from home. Um, thanks for covering for me. But on yeah. TV, it was fun because like sometimes the depth perception in the arena, you yeah. can't quite see. Yeah. On TV, it was like, he's almost by the three-point line. Yeah, he really And then it's him. dribble, dribble, <laughs> dribble, and there was no foul there. Um, I was laughing about that play for a long time. It's, yeah. it's so good. He's fun. just he's just unstoppable, man. Like the the way he's played recently has just been incredible. I've never seen 
in person. Like I've watched like a fair amount of basketball. I've I've never seen a player like Cat. Well, I mean, like like we we went through his averages before, but it's like I mean, over the last five games, the guy's almost he's averaging three points less than forty a game. Yeah, like that's nuts. It's wild. Um, yeah, I mean. 34, 37, 42, 28, 41. Yeah, you look at that. I was looking at his box score and I was like, oh, 28 points. Like, that's like kind of a dud. And then I was like, wait a minute. Like, what am I saying? Yeah. Like, what was that? Like, 28 and how many rebounds did he have that game? Uh, he had 28 and, well, I just switched it to, um, sorry. I just switched my basketball reference to, uh, he had 10 rebounds. Yeah. But I switched it to his game scores. Yeah. Uh, in the last, like, week, the Thunder game was his third best game of the season. The game against the Hawks was his fourth. The game against the Kings last week was his sixth. Um, and then you go down, and against the Pacers was his tenth. So we've yeah. had, he's had like three of his best ten games yeah. in the last week. And um, I think a lot of that is also Ryan Saunders' offense. Yep. Because the offense is going through him, um, which you don't see as much anymore. And that's I mean, that, that probably goes to if you, if you say, what are the Wolves going to focus in on free agency in the draft? Um, I think it's probably fa- it's fair to say that they're going to load up on shooters totally around Carl. If if that's where he's too much of a vacuum yeah. to not take. If if Ryan gets the job next year and that's the offense they're going to run, right? Yeah. I think I think that's probably what's going to happen. Um, before we get to the Tony Campbell um, interview, I just want to pitch uh, something that Julian here worked very hard on over like a four or five day stretch. Um, and and James Bruno, hopefully you listen to this. I've ma- I imagine you're not going to though. He's probably not. No, he doesn't have Twitter. He doesn't. He's, he's he's off the grid. Yeah, he's the most off. He's a web developer. For, yeah, for those who don't know him, um, he's the most off the grid web developer. Maybe he just like understands the evils of the internet better mm, than he, everyone better, else. And yeah, doesn't, he, he would. doesn't want to subject himself to it. Which you know, that's that's fair. I called him Jimmy Bruno once. How did that go? Doesn't like that. What did he do? Nothing. Oh yeah, he like didn't laugh. Yeah. Well, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, like if 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 like James like James Bruno. Doesn't sound like. I mean, he sounds like a web developer, Jimmy Bruno. It's a, it's a fine name, Jimmy Bruno. <laughs> yeah, it's a great name. It's a James Bruno. Right, is a great yeah. name. I'm yeah. just saying, Jimmy Bruno. It adds a little flavor to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he flavor doesn't like, town. He doesn't want flavor. That's fine. Um, but yeah, he made an incredible website. He did. Um, on the WNBA side, for some reason, um, we are a little more limited um, on what we can and can't do on the, the sites, which I think. Um, is a conver- bigger conversation. They're different. Why can't uh, we just platforms? Yeah, yeah. We should have the same platform for both. I, I would argue. But we could have somebody not, on and talk. I'm not about trying that. to not trying to get yeah. in trouble. Um, but he did an incredible job. If you go to linksbasketballcom slash draft dash central, um, there's player profiles, mock drafts, uh, the draft order, uh, draft information. Julian wrote a column on um, kind of what what uh, what it means for the links to have as many picks as they have this year. Um, so um, we're, we'll probably have a podcast dedicated to the links, um, and the drafts coming up soon, but we, we had an interview with Cheryl Reeve, uh, on Tuesday this week and, and she broke down everything for us. We had her on for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, kind of broke down the picks, how this draft compares to other drafts, how, sh- how excited she is for the, the sixth pick and maybe what kind of player they can get, um, some free agency talk, um, so we're super excited. We'll have some pieces up next week for that. Also, if you missed her CNN interview, oh yeah, go watch that. It's been a really big week for, for yeah, Cheryl. Sure. Cheryl went on CNN, and then ten minutes later, she Talk called us. us. So I kind of I was like, wow, you. This is not as important as what you were just talking about. But it's about. very nice that she, uh, even though she's a star, yeah, took a little time to talk to the the blog boys at basketball dot com. Yep. So go check that out uh, again. I know it's a, it's a impossible to find information on some of these WNBA draft prospects, yeah, which, which is backwards, and we're trying to change that narrative. And um, hopefully, all the information we have is right, but sometimes it is hard. Probably to, not. But it's hard to find information. Exactly. So a lot of us it's just us watching the film and looking at the stats and kind of making our like our, our best guess. There's a little bit of opinion, yeah, in, the, in these draft profiles, and I won't lie to you about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a really, really interesting WNBA draft. I think it's a pretty deep draft. Um, the, Lynx, the Lynx have a ton of picks. We have five. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a few picks that are in the type of range where you'd see players who will really stick around on the roster. So, I don't know. It's, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think it's going to be a really interesting couple of weeks. This is my fifth year here, and I don't remember a draft. 
that's been as important for this for the, for the huge links. for the franchise. But yeah, we can go into that. Uh, we'll do that in another pod. Another pod. Uh, Tony Campbell here he is. Uh, uh, three seasons with the Wolves. Uh, great guy to talk to. Really um, great. excellent. Um, hope you guys enjoy. As the Timberwolves celebrate thirty seasons. Uh, we are joined by another Timberwolves legend here, Tony Campbell. Tony, how are hey, you? Hey, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good. To, it's good to see you. Um, I know we were really excited um, to have you in. I mean, like, I don't think people realize this, especially people, you know, the younger crowds. But um, you were like the first Timberwolves star. I mean, like that your second year here. I think you averaged like 22 points a game over the three years, 21 points uh, per game. Uh, what were your early impressions? Because you you were part of the expansion draft um, of Minnesota, and how was how was that process? Because that's something we haven't really seen um, in quite some time. Yeah, well, you know, the, the NBA was expanding, and uh, uh, um, the uh, city of uh, Minnesota, the state of Minnesota, I should say, uh, and the Twin Cities, uh, you know, bid and, and and won the bid to have an expansion team, and 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 that was the ball um, rolling there. And um, I was fortunate enough, though, to be a free agent at the time. And um, they had the draft, and, and they still needed more players. And then I came in uh, as a free agent, um, you know, here uh, in the Twin Cities. And um, I'll tell you, it was, it was, it was a great blessing um, to be one of the first um, in anything is always a good thing, though, know, because people a lot of times remember the people who were the first, the pioneers, so to speak, though. And, I, you know, I, I feel as though I was a pioneer and still am a pioneer, you know, as far as the, this franchise is concerned. I remember collecting basketball cards when I was young, and um, <laughs> I remember, like, just reading the back of your, your your car being like, 21 points a game? This guy's awesome. I have, like, 30, 40 cards of you. Um, what allowed you in Minnesota to have so much success um, you know, well, early on? Well, I think I think a lot of it, um, you know, came from the fact that um, you know we had um, we had a great coach um, who motivated us though, and who um, taught us basically though to uh, you know understand you know our roles you know in the unit um, versus being individuals. Um, I think um, you know uh, Coach Musselman um, brought out the hard work ethic in us, uh, where you know we we were a group of guys though working collectively to have success and that it wasn't about an individual and with hard work, dedication, commitment, um, that we would, um, uh, be successful. And I think, um, for the most part being an expansion team and no one really giving us a chance though, we felt, um, I guess, uh, we felt though that, um, you know, we were in it for ourselves, that we really had nobody in our corner except our fans who were going to prove the world differently. And so when we played and when we practiced, though, we played and practiced as though it was just us. And as a result, though, I think what happened was uh, many teams came in uh, here thinking that they had an easy win, uh, but but it turned out the, the total opposite, though, that they had to work and that, um, you know, it was a knock them down, drag them out, you know, session every time somebody walked in the door. Uh, you, you talked about Musselman and just kind of a. I think when you look at coaches in NBA history, you know, for him to start in the CBA and he kind of grinded his way into the league. And uh, I, I guess, like, you know, pardon my language, but like he was kind of a hard ass, I think. But as a coach, and, and you were a veteran when you came on the team, was that something new that was, was in the league? Or were there other coaches like him? Because he seemed kind of unique. Coach was still unique, uh, you know, uh, you know, all in all. However, though, there were other coaches out there, though, who were just as tough as he was. Uh, you know, I had a coach before I came, uh, you know, to the Timberwolves. Um, I thought Chuck Daly, um, you know, was a you know was a great coach, though, but he was also, you know, a taskmaster in the sense that you know he didn't take no, uh, uh, you know, no excuses. Um, you know, he wanted you to deliver. He wanted you to come out and play hard. And if you didn't, then you would hear it from him. Uh, coach Musselman, in his own way, um, basically was. Um, was, was, was just, first of all, he was a military guy. Um, and if he wasn't, though, he, he sure acted like one. Um, but he was just, you know, he had he had this military presence, though. He was like the, he was like the sergeant. And, uh, you know, as soldiers, though, we felt that, um, you know, we, uh, we, we had our leader and that he had to, um, and that all he had to do was just tell us what to do and that, and that we would do it because we were all dedicated. And then we all had chips on our shoulders, too, because, you know, a lot of us came from the CBA and uh, when we were Timberwolves, um, many of us uh, felt that, uh, you know, we had something to prove 
And so anybody walking in, though, uh, you know, they were in trouble for so many different reasons. Uh, you guys played in the Metronome. Um, there's so many records that are never going to be broken that were that were set there just simply because of how many fans that could fit in there. And I think uh, um, just the passion of Minnesota, because they didn't have a basketball team, obviously, since the, the Minneapolis Lakers. So they get basketball back. They, they filled up that the Metronome pretty much um, – you know, every game. What was it like playing in an arena like that? Because I, I, I was talking to somebody about the Final Four, and it's going to be in Minneapolis this, this year at U.S. Bank Stadium. And you're talking about 70,000 people at a basketball game where when it sells out here, it's, you know, at Target Center, 19,000 people about. Um, I couldn't imagine that triple. <laughs> what was that like? Let me tell you, it was a tough place to play um, if you weren't used to it. Um, I think in the beginning, though, um, even, even the home team, um, we had to get very, we had to get used to it because you're dealing with number one, uh, you know the locker room was it, it felt like the locker room was on the other side of the building. <laughs> so by the time you walked to the um, to the court for just for a warm up, you had a workout. Um, um, also, um, you had to deal with the fact that the size and the openness of the place, so the depth perception was I was going to ask about that was 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 vast. And because of that, though, you know, you had to, there were adjustments you had to make. And, you know, with all of that, though, I think uh, as a team, uh, with our hard work ethic, um, our hard hat mentality, I like to say, uh, you know, we, uh, we used that to our advantage. So we got used to it. Other teams, uh, on the other hand, now they had to come in and they had to adjust to deal with the depth perception uh, and sometimes uh, even the temperature uh, in the building, you know, would get you. Um, and uh, let alone the walk from the, the locker room. I was going to say, they, they show like the clips of, on you know TNT and Sports <laughs> Center or at ESPN of the players running out into the court. <laughs> For you guys, you guys probably walked to the to the court and then ran on um, out of the tunnel For so, sure. so you didn't wear yourself out. Um, <laughs> s- since <laughs> That's what I would do at least. I, you know, yeah, I, no yeah. way am I running the whole way. Uh, <laughs> obviously, since you've played in, I mean, the last like five years, the game has changed so much uh you know with three pointers and uh le- less of an inside game obviously mid range uh you know shots are like you get suspended if you take those now um <laughs> if your game how how would your game fit in today's nba and you see kind of that three point revolution would you have maybe joined that or, or how do you see i mean i'm sure you think about it how would your game have aged to today's nba you know that's a great question though um because um you know, I um, didn't really take advantage of the three-point line much. Um, I would get my three-pointers the old-fashioned way, basically just, uh, you know, beating my man to the basket, getting fouled, and then going to the free throw line. But, I mean, you said that, like, nobody really did, though. Nobody took advantage of the three-point line then, as you know, compared um, to today. Well, not many people, not many people, though, although it was there, though, and uh, I think the trend was, you know, to shoot more of those threes to extend – uh, uh, to expand defenses, and then that would open up opportunities to drive the ball, and then even throw the ball down, you know, on the block. Um, so, um, if you were to take my game then, and then you would you were to somehow, um, you know, transplant it onto today's game, it would pretty much be the same game. You know, I would, you know, I had a mid range game where you know where a lot of my points came in the mid range, and I think just just being creative with the ball, um, just uh, you know, uh, understanding the triple threat. And understanding, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, you know, stayed in the gym and shot a lot of jump shots, though that that I could have made a living easily, um, um, you know, in today's game, um, and also, um, you know, you you alluded to it though, you know, the post up game was not is not really uh, a, a big part of the game anymore. The three point shot, the crossover, and the dunk. Um, but um, in today's game, uh, my game would have translated. And if coach would have allowed it, though, I was a big two guard. So uh, I took guys down in the post and posted up, though. So, so I would, I, I would hope that uh, if I were playing in today's game, though, that my coach would see that I would have the the advantage, um, speed, strength, and accuracy wise to to post other guards up, uh, you know, in the game. I it's, could see you posting up a guy like C.J. McCollum in today's <laughs> NBA. Is there a player now that you see in the NBA who you think kind of has a game similar to yours? Are there, do you see yourself in any players right now in the league? Um, you know, it's funny, though, because um, I, see, you know, I see a couple guys in the, you know, in the league um, who, who I think passion-wise um, um, you know, may, you know, may, may have been me in, the, in another life. Um, but the game has changed so much now um, with the three-point shot and the you know the step back dribble and the jump shot uh, with a lot of guys though that um, you know it would be hard for me to really say um, um, who um, who I could say is right. like myself though yeah. 
Um, I, if, if I thought about it, um, the name eludes me right now um, of, of, of one player or another, though. But I would just say, though, that uh, my game was pretty much a game of, of simplicity, basically, though. I just took advantage of my strength, my speed and quickness uh, against anybody. And um, nowadays, though, it's a lot of – it's, it's a lot of trickery with, with in and out dribbles and crossovers and behind the back dribbles and spin moves and things like that that um, I, I didn't really um, um, use a lot of only when I really had to. But right. you, see a, you see a plethora of it you know, nowadays. Yeah, five-foot step backs in Houston from James Harden and stuff like that. Yeah, kind of um, like an, elite, <laughs> an, an illegal step back. Yeah, from, oh, for sure. From, yeah, from my view. Oh, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, like, so... I want. I kind of want to talk more about how the game has changed. Do you think um, you, you know when you watch a game? Are you are there certain aspects where you're like, oh, this is good. This is good for the game. And then are there other aspects where you kind of liked it better? You know, 20 years ago when you know, or you know, longer than that, I guess. But uh, you know, back when it was a little more in and out. Well, you know, um, you know what the part that I feel um, basketball is lacking is the fact that the post up game is kind of gone. Um, I think that you know our big men now are being brought up now, you know, as guards, so to speak, where they're you know where they're taught to shoot, you know, shoot the three point shot um, a lot more. Although you know there's still some big guys you know posting up. Don't get me wrong though, but um, it's it's almost like it's not like the it's not like it's the thing of the day or it's like the go to um, play. Um, you know, um, you see. You see big big guys training because I train a lot of big guys though, and you know they all want they all want to be able to shoot the three pointer just as much as they um, you know work with their back to the basket. So so I would say though that um, you know while we're going away from big men posting up, um, I I think that that it's a vital part of basketball that should um, be used more, um, and players should be taught it more. Um, in a world where uh, players are being taught now, you know, not to work too much on their post moves and and you know, um, you know, up and under moves and things like that, though. But instead, um, to be able to shoot a three point shot, though, because of the of the the Euro uh, mentality, mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you What are you up to now? Where are you living? Uh, what are you doing? Staying around basketball. I'm living in Jersey right now, and um, you know I um, you know I work basketball camps in the summer. I just transitioned from one uh, a, a one job to another one where I was the athletic director at a high school in Brooklyn, New York, and and and. Um, basketball coach, soccer coach, and baseball coach. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, the trifecta. That's cool. Yeah, well, I'm pretty good at I'm pretty good at uh, uh, coaching soccer and baseball just as uh, uh, just as well. Uh, but then um, now I'm at a school now where um, I am uh, more of an administrator though, which which because of the state rules don't allow me to coach at my school. Mm. But I make up for it though. Um, I make up for it by doing individual workouts um, uh, with players, and then I do camps all summer, um, and so. Uh, I, I, so to speak, um, keep my sword sharpened um, in the summers and when I'm doing individual workouts. Um, and then during the basketball season, uh, like I said, I'm doing all of the administrative stuff, principal and vice vice principal and dean and stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, I mean, this has been awesome to have you. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have John Thomas get you here more often. Uh, this is a fun Well, that's talk. the plan. You know, I tell you, uh, you know, I, I, I miss the Twin Cities. Um, I've uh, for many years have um, looked for opportunities to be here, um, and I consider it all timing. Everything is timing. Everything is just being in the right place at the right time. You know, a need uh, uh, arising, and then you know being able to answer that need. Um, so you know, I feel like I feel like the need may be you know maybe coming up now, and that uh, you would see me here more often. And I look forward to it. I, I'm, I'm talking to you guys and uh, being on the radio and doing podcasts and all that good stuff. That's fun. Um, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you to my main man, Tony C. That's what we call him. After an interview, I call him Tony C now. That's fine. That's fine, yeah. Uh, thanks to James Bruno, a.k.a. Jimmy Bruno. Jimmy B. Uh, thanks to Julian Andrews, who's here all the time. Yep. Um, I, live thank- in, I live in the studio. You actually. live in the studio. And most importantly, thank you to you for listening. We appreciate it. We will talk to you guys next week.